is a seasonal business. My name is Michelle Wansley Ford, and I am the Executive Director of the Center for Racial Justice and Education and the founder of London Plain Advisory. This statement that anti-racism is a seasonal business is one I've made at least 100 times since June 1st, the Monday after George Floyd was murdered in Minnesota and two and a half months after Breonna Taylor was murdered in Kentucky. I fielded inquiry calls from schools, school systems, and nonprofits all over the country. Communities left reeling in the wake of COVID and civil protest. And while I've spent the last several years of my career focused on the urgent matter of dismantling racism in education, education isn't the industry where my story begins. 20 years ago, I started my career at a magazine which had launched just the month before. That summer of 2000 was the most exciting professional period of my young life. I imagined my future unrolling before me with opportunities in sales and marketing and hope to make my mark. I was the only intern and only black person as far as I could see on the publishing side of the magazine. I'd heard that others worked on the editorial side, but I never saw them because we were in different buildings. My role that summer was to support the work of the sales staff in understanding our growing readership and sussing out the kind of consumer data that would attract prospective advertisers. The magazine had only put out one or two issues when I joined, so the energy in the office was magnetic every single day of my internship. My specific task that summer, among other things, was to read mail, tons of mail, thousands of pieces of mail over the course of that internship. Mail from readers who'd started to share their stories with our team from a place of excitement about the new magazine, their hopes and dreams for what we'd write in our pages, the kind of content we'd share, the people we'd feature, and how they might see themselves reflected in that book. Mail came mostly from women, sending in messages written on everything from beautifully monogrammed stationery saying, great job, and keep up the good work, to please help me, I've tried everything and don't know who else to turn to, scrawled hastily on notebook paper. That summer stood out as a character study of myself, my boss, our readers, and their muse. More on that later. My boss, Alice, would wander over to my desk in the corner of the cubicle bullpen to regularly ask me what I was reading from our subscribers. She was keenly interested in what they had to say and how it might impact our ability to pitch advertising space to companies across a variety of industries. She'd walk over, always barefoot having left her designer pumps under her desk, dressed in smart summer tweed and sticking her hand into the bowl of peanut butter cups I kept on my desk. What you reading today, Michelle? She was a white woman from Mississippi whose slow southern drawl seemed as place in the hustle and bustle of this high-rise New York City office building but whose insatiable curiosity to know more about our reader was an indication that her mind was racing a mile a minute. I'd pull out some of the most compelling notes and share them with her. She cared about the content of those messages, seemingly on a level deeper than just seeing them as reader letters, subscriber data, or consumer insights. She saw them as messages from real people. A salient memory from that experience is having accompanied her on a sales call to a major beauty company as we waited in the wood paneled conference room at the oval shaped table for our meeting to begin. Alice seemed just a touch nervous. This was a new endeavor after all. But when our contact arrived and as she began laying out the magazine's mission, its brand and why they should run pages with us, what they might expect their ROI to be, I could see her soften and sharpen. As the only other person from the publishing team in the meeting with her, I realized then that I was watching a masterclass in magazine sales and eventually in leadership and mentorship. I was paying rapt attention, taking notes for our report back to the sales team, but also for my own learning. When Alice turned to me and asked, who is our reader, Michelle? I was surprised to be engaged in the conversation as a 20 year old college student with the magazine's publisher and the senior executive. She smiled at me confidently and I began to share exactly the kinds of insights I'd been sharing with her all summer who the reader was, what they were interested in, why they said they wrote to us, what they wanted, if anything at all. I shared any and all of what I thought I might be able to tell from the heaps of reader mail that had become a fixture in the office, taking on a magical life of its own. Almost like the fabled sword in the stone, the letter seemed to be both the sword and the stone. Ultimately, we won those pages. We left the meeting and Alice high-fived me in the elevator on the way back down to the lobby. 
That internship solidified what excellence in industry looked like, what it meant to have my work taken seriously as an emerging marketing professional, and how I believed that leaders that looked different than me could and would show up to support my growth and development. I say that, you know, that experience really put me uh, in a place in history that I'd never been before. And I say a part of history because that magazine was, oh, the Oprah magazine. The magazine is still heralded as the most successful magazine launch in publishing history in terms of readership and advertising pages sold. And Alice was Alice Alston, the then publisher who went on to be named Media Maven of the Year by Advertising Age magazine. I went on to work at another magazine the following year, starting just days before 9-11, but that's a completely different story. But that summer at O, eating countless peanut butter cups and reading even more reader letters will always remain a magical one where I felt like I was a part of history. After grad school, I found myself in organizational consulting, talent, and eventually diversity and inclusion in the education and other nonprofit and for-profit spaces. Today, I want to talk to you about these themes in particular the critical nature of working, managing, and leading with an anti-racist lens to innovate to a broad and holistic view of the racial justice movement and your role as creatives in telling the story of our time. I also wanna lay out a little bit of a framework and some insights about how to engage meaningfully with the world around you regarding the social and political landscape to effectively incorporate what you are seeing into what you are doing. The current social and political climate requires leaders to be mindful of how they take cues from the world around them, to manage, to lead, and to carry organizations forward. For those folks working to create and innovate through art, ideas, and collaborative partnerships, being observant, responsive, and relevant takes on even more importance. The United States and the world are in a place of reckoning relative to race, identity, the impact of a capitalist system, and its attendant longstanding practices of imbalance, injustice, and imperialism. In a North American context in particular, interlocking systems of oppression which have long harmed and hobbled people of color are being challenged by activists and everyday concerned citizens to transform our nation. Every pocket of our shared world is subject to scrutiny, from policy to industry, from public to private sector. We as individuals are charged with examining our role in and participation with the systems that cause such harm. In the work that I do, I rely on a three-part framework to support leaders in becoming anti-racist and building anti-racist organizations. And as I am doing this work, I am focused on the work of white people and people of color. These groups have different things to do within the context of dismantling racism and systems. Before we have any hope of taking effective and sustainable action, we have to realize that we need shared, codified language relative to what we're even contending with. This is known as developing a critical analysis. Critical analysis provides a lens through which we can begin to understand the complexity of history, the importance of theoretical analysis and connected to that history with our individual identity and therefore way of reading the world. Paulo Freire, author of the seminal work, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, terms reading the world as having a critical consciousness. Critical consciousness is the ability to intervene in reality in order to change it. Our role as folks who are trained to see and make sense of is then to do something with that information. The second piece of the framework is to understand that every organization exists first and foremost as a system containing actors who arrive to the system with different mental models. So differently, we are each bringing our own identities, lived experiences, values, and beliefs with us to whatever space we enter. There is no such thing as compartmentalization. Who we are anywhere is who we are everywhere. And as such, it behooves us to know who we are in doing so, to witness who we are so that we may witness others. In that witnessing, our companies, our organizations and institutions can go from being systems by default to communities by design, collections of people that are defined not by our respective roles and relative power, but by our shared values of mutual care and concern, the tenets which fundamentally make a community. Finally, in possession of a critical analysis and an unrelenting desire for community, we can demonstrate culturally appropriate, racially specific behaviors which allow us to consistently witness one another's humanity, 
by consciously creating an interlocking set of systems whose primary aim is to create care and concern for one another. Audre Lorde tells us that it is not our differences that divide us. It is our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences. Anti-racist leadership is a principle of recognizing, accepting, and celebrating difference. It is in the, the act of challenging inherently racist practices, policies, and personal behavior, of interrupting racism when it happens within ourselves, between people, and throughout our organizations. Two of the most useful tools which I've encountered of late include the Continuum on Becoming an Anti-Racist and Multicultural Institution and the Lean Canvas Business Planning Tool. I've paired these documents, these tools together to offer individuals and institutions a simple and manageable way by which to assess their organization and where it exists in its efforts to become actively anti-racist. Then, in considering those problems, thinking about examples of how the organization does exist with racist policies and practices and how it can move itself forward on the continuum towards becoming an anti-racist multicultural institution Individuals and institutions can use a template, a tool, a way of thinking and being that allows them to apply these issues to a way of solving bigger systemic problems. This is what continues to evolve as the institutional anti-racism planning tool, if you will. It's just a way of um, managing systems change effectively in any organization. These tools will be presented later today during the masterclass where leaders who might be banging their heads against the wall can be in community together to brainstorm their way to a new present and future. Whichever tools an individual or institution uses to understand their commitment to anti-racist ways of being, the important components remain critical analysis, conscious reflection, and committed behavior change. There is no different world without a commitment of individuals in it to do something unprecedented different and disruptive. This is in fact how we arrive at this critical juncture in our shared history, here and around the world. The movement for black lives is experiencing groundbreaking reach as the largest social movement in the history of the United States on the basis of sheer numbers of protesters who participated in person and online to witness police brutality and to combat its prevalence, particularly in communities of black and brown people. The organization I lead, the Center for Racial Justice and Education, is in the trenches of addressing racial justice around the country. I stepped into the role of executive director on January 13th, and just two months later, it became apparent that COVID stood to be a significant public health crisis in New York City and around the country. Given the complexity of COVID's impact, just two months after that, I was forced to lay off vital members of the organization's program and research functions. The following week, police in Minnesota murdered George Floyd. And by the Monday following his murder, I saw such an uptick in traffic to our website that it crashed repeatedly, unable to handle the steady flow of inquiries to our organization. This reality taught me two things very quickly. One, that the work of anti-racism can be seasonal in nature. And two, that it absolutely shouldn't be in organizations committed to the practice of anti-racism must be prepared for the constant ebb and flow of interest that our culture and society seems to have in racial justice for all people, particularly when those people are Black. Combating persistent and pernicious racism must go beyond symbolic acts of solidarity and unity. Companies must rise above the need to recruit enough Black and Indigenous people of color and other people of color to meet some imagined bar relative to racial justice and diversity. And those same companies must go beyond the creation of employee resource groups to witness the humanity of employees of color. It isn't just hiring a chief diversity officer, penning diversity statements, or signing joint statements with other leaders from other companies. Companies and the leaders within them must examine their own regular day-to-day -day practices regarding recruitment, retention and development, employee disciplinary action and decision-making power in order to develop a critical consciousness about the world they create as a system and a leader within it. Similarly, we as individuals have a responsibility on the basis of our respective racial identities to socially and politically locate ourselves first in the system of the world and society, and then most immediately and perhaps most importantly within the systems we inhabit, our family relationships, our partnerships, our jobs. To do this, to witness the relationships closest to us and to explore our power within them is necessary and urgently so. 
What are we willing to give up to guarantee a future worthy of generations to come? Who are we willing to be? Our charge is to develop an analysis, commit to creating community, and address our individual commitments to creating a more racially just company and culture in the world. Speaking bluntly, people of color must begin to center our own health and wellness within organizations that purport to value our presence and want to see us thrive. And white leaders and managers must recognize their own positional power as leaders and managers and understand how their white racial identity augments their experience within organizations and in society. Our work is critical and complementary and should be pursued with urgency and clarity of purpose. This conference is as much about resistance and responsibility as it is about representation. We've moved beyond the moment which focuses on where Black people are and aren't. Black people were never meant to stay there. We were never meant to survive. The conversation around where we are and aren't is a conversation about survival. In a time where the value of Black life is still a thing of debate, that whole industries are birthed from the need to point out and protect the value of those lives, the focus needs to move with all expedience to for, towards fierce advocacy and conscientiousness, anti-racist leadership from would-be allies. Like Alice, a white woman from Mississippi who not only saw me, but valued me, who brought me to the table and then gave me the mic. That experience set me up for professional success in a way that I will never fully understand, but it set the bar much, fire for, much higher for how I choose my professional opportunities. So where does that leave us and where does it leave you? It means that by the end of today's sessions, on the heels of hours of programming painstakingly organized and curated for this audience, that each of us, in the full knowledge of our racial identity and experience, and as Black people in particular, in particular recognize our own work in this space to challenge systems strategically as well as revolutionary, revolutionarily. As other people of color, as partners to get into good trouble, as the late John Lewis would say, and as white people to be allies and accomplices, challenging those very structures which uphold white supremacy in our culture and from which you benefit. I remember being surprised to learn that Oprah's plan was to be the only person on her magazine's cover for the foreseeable future. In the 20 years since that magazine launched, she has held true to her promise with only three exceptions, Michelle Obama, Ellen DeGeneres, and Breonna Taylor. I understand that this December will be the last print issue of Oprah's magazine, and it has been quite the run. I can only speculate that this has to do with the shifting print market, but also, presumably, Miss Winfrey has other work to do. We all have work to do, and today is a good day to start. Thank you.